Shalom, shalom, most high in Christ bless. Happy Sabbath to everyone. Today is uh, January 6th, 2024. And um, we want to give um, all glory and honor to God our Father um, in heaven. We want to give all glory and honor to Christ our King. Um, we say shalom and we salute and we give double honors to the uh, to the elders, to the bishops, uh, to the deacons, to the captains, to the officers, um, to the soldiers, to the brothers uh, in their respective places, um, working to usher in God's kingdom. We also likewise um, say shalom to um, the sisters, um, that being the elder women, the mothers, the wives, um, uh, the sisters, the children, everyone in their respective place. Um, here at Children of Israel Ministries, on for our Sabbath class, we always start off. We take about five minutes or so to read um, to read the laws. Um, we don't provide any commentary or what have you. We just simply read the law for about five minutes or so, then we get into the, the topic. And that's where, you know, it's um, a lesson. All right. So uh, with no further ado, uh, let us get started. But uh, uh, I apologize, I said no further ado. Subscribe to the channel, share the video, uh, push the like button, watch to the end. Now I can say with no further ado, let's get started. The laws, Ecclesiasticus chapter 39, verse one. But he that giveth his mind to the law of the most high and is occupied in the meditation thereof will seek out the wisdom of all the ancient and be occupied in prophecies. He will keep the sayings of the renowned men and where subtle parables are, he will be there also. He will seek out the secrets of grave sentences and be conversant in dark parables. He shall serve among great men and appear before princes. He will travel through strange countries where he hath tried the good and the evil among men. Fear your father and mother, Leviticus 19 and 3. Ye shall fear every man in his, I'm sorry, every man his mother and his father, and keep my Sabbath. I am the Lord your God. Not to be a re rebellious son, Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 18. If a man have a stubborn and rebellious son, which will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and that when they have chastened him, will not hearken unto them. Mourn for relatives, Leviticus 10 and 19. And Aaron said unto Moses, Behold, this day have they offered their sin offerings and their burnt offerings before the Lord, and such things have befallen me. And if I had eaten the sin offering today, should it have been accepted in the sight of the law. The high priest must not defile himself for any relative. Leviticus chapter 21, verse 11. Neither shall he go in to any dead body, nor defile himself for his father or for his mother. The high priest must not enter under the same roof as a corpse. Leviticus 21 and 11. Neither shall he go into any dead body, nor defile himself for his father or for his mother. Cohen must not defile himself 
by going to funerals or cemeteries for any except relatives. Leviticus chapter 21, verse 1. And the Lord said, Moses, speak unto the priests, the sons of Aaron, and say unto them, There shall none be defiled for the dead among his people. Appoint a king from Israel, Deuteronomy 17 and 15. Thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee, whom the Lord thy God shall choose. One from among thy brethren shall thou seat, set king over thee. Thou mayest not sit as stranger over thee, which is not thy brother. Not to appoint a foreigner as king over the nation of Israel. Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 15. Thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee, whom the Lord thy God shall choose. One from among thy brethren shalt thou set king over thee. Thou mayest not set a stranger over thee, which is not thy brother. The king must not multiply too many, too many wives to himself. Deuteronomy 17 and 17. Neither shall he multiply wives to himself, that his heart turn not away. Neither shall he greatly multiply to himself silver and gold. The king must not have too many horses. Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 16. But he shall not multiply horses to himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt, to the end that he should multiply horses. For as much as the Lord hath said unto you, ye shall henceforth return no more that way. The king must not have too much silver and gold. Deuteronomy 17 and 17. Neither shall he multiply wives to himself, to his hurt, to, that his heart turn not away. Neither shall he greatly multiply to himself silver and gold. Destroy the seven Canaanite nations. Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 17. But thou shalt utterly destroy them, namely the Hittites and the Amorites, the Canaanites and the Perizzites, the Hivites and the Jebusites, as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee. Not to let any of the seven Canaanite nations remain alive. Deuteronomy 20 and 16. But of the cities of the, these people, which the Lord thy God doth give thee for an inheritance, thou shalt save if thou shalt save alive nothing that breathe. Wipe out the memory of Amalek. Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 19. Therefore it shall be, when the Lord thy God hath given thee rest from all thine enemies round about, in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance, to possess it, that thou shalt blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven, Thou shalt not forget it. Remember what Amalek did to the children of Israel. Deuteronomy 25 and 17. Remember what Amalek did unto, the, unto thee by the way, when ye were come forth out of Egypt. Not to forget Amalek's atrocities and ambush on, your, on our journey from Egypt in the desert. Deuteronomy chapter 25 verse 19. Therefore it shall be, when the Lord thy God hath given thee rest from all thine enemies round about, and the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance to possess it, that thou shalt blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. Thou shalt not forget it. <clears throat> not to dwell permanently in Egypt. Deuteronomy 17 and 16. But he shall not multiply horses to himself, not cause the people to return to Egypt uh, to the end that he should multiply horse, horses. For as much as the Lord hath said unto you, ye shall henceforth return no more that way. Offer peace terms to the inhabitants of a city while holding siege and treat them according to the Torah if they accept the terms. Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 10. When thou comest nigh, unto a city to fight against it, then proclaim peace unto it. Not to offer peace to Ammon and Moab while besieging them. 
Deuteronomy 23 and 7, Thou shalt not abhor an Edomite, for he is thy brother. Thou shalt not abhor an Egyptian, because thou was a stranger in his land. Not, not to destroy food trees even during the siege. Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 19. When thou shalt besiege a city a long time, and making war against it to take it, thou shalt not destroy the trees thereof by forcing an axe against them. For thou mayest eat of them, and thou shalt not cut them down. For the tree of the field is man's life, to employ them in the siege. Prepare latrines outside the camps. Deuteronomy 23 and 13. And thou shalt have a paddle upon thy weapon. And it shall be when thou wilt ease thyself abroad, thou shalt dig therewith, and shalt turn back and cover that which cometh from thee. Mm -mm -mm. Prepare a shovel for each soldier to dig with. Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 14. For the Lord thy God walketh in the midst of thy camp to deliver thee and to give up thine enemies before thee. Therefore shall thy camp be holy, that he see no unclean thing in thee, and turn away from thee. Appoint a priest to speak with the soldiers during the war. Deuteronomy 20 and 2. And it shall be, when ye are among, uh, when, you, when ye are come nigh unto the battle, that the priest shall approach to speak unto the people. My eyes are all right, and we will begin with 606 next time, Lord willing. 606 next time, Lord willing. All right, um, the title of today's topic class is Made a Living Soul. Made a Living Soul. Okay, so get your notebooks, get your Bible, your King James Bible um, with the Apocrypha, the 1611 King James Bible with, with, that includes the Apocrypha, something to write with, um, something to, uh, to take good notes. And here we go. Let's get into it. Go to Genesis chapter two, verse seven. Are you able to read for me or no? Okay, y'all yeah, read. Genesis 2. This is Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. And man became a living soul. So <clears throat> here we see God forming man out of the dust of the ground. He breathes into him, into his nostrils, the breath of life. When he breathes into him, he becomes a living soul. Okay. Um, write this question down. Write down this question. The soul. What is it? And where or who does it come from? The soul. What is it? And where or who does it come from? So it's with this question in mind. Um, that we kind of want to uh, pursue tonight's class, all right? Let us go to second asterisk. Second asterisk, chapter three, verse five.
Second is chapter three, verse five. And gave us a body upon Adam without soul, which was the workmanship of thine hands. And this breathed into him the breath of life. And he was made living before thee. Okay. So at the first, when he created Adam, he created, he created man. Um, and he's just this, this lifeless piece of clay. Okay. It's not until he breathes into him that he, that he becomes this living creature. All right. Go to Psalms. Psalms 100, verse 3. It's the book of Psalms, chapter 100, and verse 3. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that ha hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Right? So here... The Bible is plainly telling us who is our creator. God is our creator. We have nothing to do with our creation. God is our is is our creator. Okay. Um, <clears throat> go to Psalms 139. And verse, we're going to read verses 13 through 17. All right. It's the book of Psalms, chapter 139 and verse 13. For thou hast possessed my reins. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. Okay. So he says, you, you possess my reins. Now, this is not an everyday word. Reigns meaning reigns is is that what you have on a horse? Um, Oh, this computer is going slow. It's moving slow. I apologize. I apologize. So, um, the Bible says reigns, the region of the kidney or the lower part of the back. I don't, this is not a good definition. I've seen the other definitions, um, especially in the Bible use, it says the seed of feeling or affection formerly identified with the kidneys. Um, hmm. I've seen other definitions and my computer is going slow, but this obviously in Psalms 139, for thou has possessed my reins. You control me, okay, is really what this is saying. You have controlled me. Thou has covered me in my mother's womb. Go ahead, continue on. 14, I will, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. And that my soul knoweth right well. Okay, um, I will praise thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Okay, um, I want to go this part right here. Fearfully, no, no, keep reading. Uh, where am I? Fifteen. Yeah, my stuff, my substance was not hid from thee, 
when I was made in secret and curiously wroth in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. And in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as, ye, when as yet there was none of them. How precious also are thy thoughts unto, my, unto me, O God. How great is the sum of them. Right? So here's how much the Lord um, thinks about us. Right? How precious also are thy thoughts unto me. Right? Because here you, you created me. You made me this living being. You, you uh, possess me in my reins. You made me fearful and wonderful. You, what does it mean you made me fearful and wonderful? Go to... We're going to go to Genesis chapter 1. Uh, when the computer stops acting up. Come on. Genesis chapter one, we want verse 26 through 27. The book of Genesis chapter one and verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Stop. So this is the fearfulness and wonderfulness, because we were we were to be created to manage the earth. We were, we were to be created to manage the earth, to govern all things on the earth. Okay, go on, verse 27. Verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female cre created he them. Right? So God says, hey, I created you in my image. In my image, God created, uh, he created man. Male and female created he them. Right? She, she comes from the male. But the male is created in the image of God, and the woman is created in the image of man. Okay. Um, go to Wisdom of Solomon. Chapter 7, we want verses 1 through 6. the book of was wisdom of solomon chapter 7 verse 1 i myself also am mortal man like to all and the offsprings of him that was first made of the earth and in my mother's womb was fashioned to be flesh in the time of them of 10 uh, months being ca compacted in blood of the seed of man and the pleasure that came with sleep. And when I was born, I drew in the common air and fell upon the earth, which is of like nature. And the first voice which I uttered was crying, as all others do. Mm -hmm. I was nursed in swaddling clothes uh, that with cares. Yeah. 
For there is no king that had any offer, uh, any other being of earth, of birth, sorry. For all men have one interest into life okay. and the light going out. So there is no oh, king that had it. any other beginning. Let me, let, me, let me take over if you don't if you don't mind. There's there's no king that had any other beginning of a birth. Okay. Uh so every individual was born in this way, came into came into existence this way, according to wisdom of Solomon. Right? He said, I myself also am a mortal man, right? I came about. My mother and my father, um, through the pleasure of sleep, they I was I was produced. Okay, I took in the common air, just like everyone. When I was born, that was wrapped up in swaddling clothes and and cared for. Every king has had their entry into this life in this fashion. In this manner, he says. Okay. Um, so now go back to let's go back to Psalms 139. Let's reiterate verse 16. Psalms 139, verse 16. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. And in thy book, all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. Okay. And in thy book, and in thy book, all my members were written. Okay. Go to Revelation. Revelation chapter 20, verse 12. Revelation chapter 20, verse 12. Okay. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life. Right? So there are two books. Right? Small and great stand before the God. And the books were open. These are the books of a person's life. These are the books of a person's life. And another book was open, which is the book of life. This is the book of the commandments. So the scales of balance is in accordance to these two books. This book being the standard, this book, your life, how does it measure up? How does it measure up? Okay. Um, let's go to Ezekiel chapter 18, starting at verse 4. Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 4. Behold, all souls are mine. As the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Right? So the Most High says, all souls belong to him, come from him. Every soul comes from the Most High God. Okay? And the soul that sinneth, it shall die, the Bible says. Verse 5. But if a man be just and do that which is lawful and right, and hath not eaten upon the mountains, neither hath lifted up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, neither hath defiled his neighbor's wife, 
neither hath come near to a menstruous woman, okay, eaten upon the mountains. This is mountains making reference to governments. So when the government says, um, in 2014, here in the United States, that it is okay for same-sex marriage, and you are in agreement with that, you are eating upon that mountain. Okay? Um, verse 7. And hath not oppressed any, but hath restored to the debtor his pledge. Hath spoiled none by violence, hath given his bread to the hungry, and hath covered the naked with the garment. He that hath not given forth upon usury, neither hath taken any increase, that hath withdrawn his hand from iniquity, hath executed true judgment between man and man. Usury, lending um, with interest. I lend you a dollar, I want a dollar and 20 cent in return. I lend you five dollars, I want five dollars and 50 cents in return. Okay, I give you a, uh, I, I lend you a five pound bag of sugar, I want two pounds of sugar in return. That's usury. And the Bible says that us, the children of Israel, one to another, we're not supposed to lend to our brother upon usury. To the other nations, yes, we can. But to one to another, we're not supposed to. Verse 9. Hath walked in my statutes and hath kept my judgments, to deal truly, he is just. He shall surely live, said the Lord God. If he beget a son that is a robber, a shedder of blood, and that doeth the like to any one of these things, and that doeth not any of those duties, but even hath eaten upon the mountains and defiled his neighbor's wife, hath oppressed the poor and needy, hath spoiled by violence, hath not restored the pledge, and hath lifted up his eyes to the idols, hath committed abominations. To this individual, to this individual that does these, that's where we get where he says to the soul, in verse one, verse four, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Okay, let's continue. Verse uh, 13, or verse uh, 13. Hath given forth upon usury and hath taken increase. Shall he then live? He shall not live. He hath done all these abominations. He shall surely die. His blood shall be upon him. Now, lo, if he begat a son, that seeth all his father's sins, which he hath done, and considereth, and doeth not such like, that hath not eaten upon the mountain, neither hath lifted up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, hath not defiled his neighbor's wife, neither hath oppressed any, hath not withholding the pledge, neither hath spoiled by violence, but hath given his bread to the hungry, and hath covered the naked with a garment, that hath taken off his hand from the poor, that hath not received usury nor increase, hath executed my judgment, hath walked in my statutes, he shall not die. For the iniquity of his father, he shall surely live, right? So even though this individual Right, This individual is walking in righteousness. This individual is walking according to the commandments. His father, on the other hand, his father um, does not 
walk according to the commandments. This man, he will live regardless of what happens to his father. Verse 18. As for his father, because he cruelly oppressed, spoiled his brother by violence, and did that which is not good among his people, lo, even he shall die in his iniquity. Yet say ye, why doth the son bear the iniquity of the father, when the son hath done that which is lawful and right, and hath kept all my statutes, and hath done them, he shall surely live. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. Now, this is very interesting. Right here, verse 19 and 20 is very interesting. Um, and this concept, 19 and 20, we're going to want to come back to this idea a little bit later on. Um, so, Elder, remind me, uh, if, if I don't bring it back up, ask me uh, about e Ezekiel chapter 18, 19, and 20 um, as we get as we get further on, okay? Um, so, but what's the point one more time in this? The individual, that individual has to live his life according to the commandment. If that individual does not live his life according to the commandment, that individual is going to face trouble. Go to Exodus chapter 20, verse 5. Exodus chapter 20, verse 5. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting, here's the crucial part, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Okay? So this idea right here, Exodus chapter 20, verse 5, Ezekiel chapter 18, um, verse 19 and 20, that individual who sins, they are going to pay for their transgression with their soul. That individual who walks in righteousness, they shall reap the rewards of walking in righteousness. And the father or the son will not, the behavior of the father, the behavior of the son will not have an effect on the other. Okay. Let's go to Zechariah chapter 12, verse 1. The burden of the word of the Lord for Israel, saith the Lord, which stretcheth forth the heavens and layeth the foundation of the earth and formeth the spirit of man within him. Right? So time and time again, we are seeing who is responsible for forming the spirit of man. Right? The most high God created, well, he created the first, uh, created Christ. And according to Proverbs chapter eight, Christ created all things. Most High God, the first created is Christ. Christ, at the instruction of the Father, created all things. Okay. 
go to numbers. Numbers chapter 27, verse 16. Let the Lord, the God of, of the spirits of all flesh, set a man over the congregation. So not only did he create all spirits, all souls, he said, hey, there must be order. And so he set a man over the congregation. So there, there, there's to be a man who is the head, the leader. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And we want verse 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ. And the head of the woman is the man. And the head of Christ is God. Okay? So there, there is order. There's God the Father. There's Christ the Son. There's the man. There's the woman. That is the order. Okay? And then... We can even show, uh, go to Sirach, Sirach chapter three, the woman being over the child. And she's over the child. Well, let's read it. Okay, here's the rock chapter three and verse two. For the Lord hath given the father honor over the children and hath confirmed the authority of the mother over the sons, right? So again, first Corinthians, there is order. There is God the Father who is over Christ. Christ is over the man. Man is over the woman. To extend it a little bit further, the authority of the Father is over the entire household, wife and the children. The, the Father extends his authority through, through the mother, which means the mother can she she has authority over the children and they went they went uh an extra step in saying over the sons as to say young man when you come of age you still have to honor your father and your mother that's what this verse is saying that's what this verse is saying in, in here in chapter two uh Chapter three, verse two, verse three. Whoso honoreth his father maketh an atonement for his sins. And he that honoreth his mother is as one that layeth up treasure. Okay. Whoso honoreth his father shall have joy of his own children. And when he maketh his prayer, he shall be heard. Okay. Um, so, Showing that all souls, Ezekiel 18 and 4, all souls have been created by the Father. Okay? That's that's the point. And in, in addition to that, there is an established order. Okay. Let's go to Romans chapter 6, verse 23. 
Romans chapter 6, verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Okay, so we talked about these souls being destroyed in, in Ezekiel chapter 18. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Okay, uh, the soul that doeth well, that soul shall surely live, okay? Romans chapter six and 23, we see now, how do you how do you buy death? How do you bring harm to your soul? For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Okay, so to believe on Christ, to follow in his example, the gift in return is eternal life to your soul. Eternal life to your soul, okay? Um, go to Deuteronomy. Chapter 33, verse 27. Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 27. The eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms, and he shall thrust out the enemy from before thee and shall say, destroy them, right? The eternal God, God is eternal. And not only is God eternal, he never intended for us to be mortal. He never intended for us to be mortal. Let's go to, uh, um, Wisdom of Solomon. Chapter. Chapter two, verse three. Wisdom of Solomon, chapter two, verse Twenty-three, chapter two, verse twenty-three. For God created man to be immortal, and made him to be an image of his own eternity. This is what wisdom of Solomon tells us, right? So Deuteronomy 33 and 27, God, God is eternal. And the original creation of man is that we were created to um, be immortal. Okay? Nevertheless, through envy of the devil came death into the world and they that do hold of his side, do find it. So this is heavy right here. This passage right here is heavy because what it's saying is you holding on to the ways of the devil or say it another way, you refuse to walk in righteousness. You refuse to keep the, the law, the commandments, and the faith of Jesus Christ, then you are bringing death to your soul. 
you're bringing death and destruction to your soul. Okay. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 60. We want verses 12 through 16. For the nation and kingdom that will not serve thee shall perish. Yea, those nations shall be utterly wasted. The glory of Le Lebanon shall come unto thee, the fear tree, the pine tree, and the box together to beautify the place of my sanctuary. And I will make the place of my feet glorious. The sons also of them that afflicted thee shall come bending unto thee and all they that despise thee shall bow themselves down at the soles of thy feet and they shall call thee the city of the Lord the Zion of the Holy One of Israel so this prophecy is speaking to the children of Israel this prophecy is a, a prophecy of a future time Hasn't come, has not happened yet. This prophecy is saying, when it's all said and done, I'm going to cause all of the enemies to come and bow at your feet, your the children of Israel. Verse 15. Whereas thou has been forsaken and hated, so that no man went through thee. I will make thee an eternal excellency, a joy of many generations. Right? So when it's all said and done, the children of Israel, we shall live, we have, have eternal life. Not 100% of Israel one-third of Israel. Unfortunately, two-thirds of Israel, they won't see this outcome. They will not see this outcome. And we'll get to that later. Uh, but as far as that particular prophecy that I'm quoting, let me share that. This is Zechariah chapter 13 um, and verse 8. And it shall come to pass that in all the land, saith the Lord, two parts therein shall be cut off and die, but the third shall be left therein. And I will bring the third part through the fire and will refine them as silver is refined and will try them as gold is tried. They shall call on my name and I will hear them. I will say, it is my people. And they shall say, the Lord is my God. This is speaking to the children of Israel. This entire passage, this entire book, right? In that day, there shall be a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness right? House of David. We're talking about the children of Israel. Two thirds, as we see in chapter 13, verse eight, two thirds, they're not going to do what is expected of them. Two thirds are going to continue to be disrespectful to the laws of the Most High God. Two thirds are going to continue to not be responsible and by keeping the laws of the Most High God. One third, on the other hand, one third, they're going to repent. And in the fact that they have repented, they're going to go through the fire and be refined. Okay, 
They're going to go through the fire and be refined. And this, this is a process, all right? Let's go to um, Matthew chapter 19, verse 16. Okay. Matthew chapter 19, verse 16. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? Now, what's interesting in this passage, let's, let's look at it in, in context. What's interesting is what is said next at verse 17. At verse 17, uh, the passage goes on. And he said unto him, why callest thou me good? This is Christ speaking. There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou will enter into life, keep the commandments. Notice Christ doesn't rebuke the individual asking this question about eternal life. Christ responds and gives him a straightforward answer on how to acquire eternal life. If thou will enter into life, keep the commandments. So this um, eternal life concept is a real phenomenon. It's a real thing. According, uh, out of the mouth of Jesus Christ, it's a real thing. Okay. Uh, go to Ezekiel chapter 20. We want verses 11 through 12. And I gave them my statutes and showed them my judgments, which if a man do, he shall even live in them. Moreover, also I gave them my Sabbaths, to be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctify them, okay? So if we are going to get this eternal life, obtain this eternal life, and Ezekiel says, I gave you my statutes, it means we got to study and learn these laws and, and learn how to walk in the laws, understand what the judgments are for breaking these laws. Okay? We have to keep the Sabbath day, the, the weekly Sabbath day that, that happens on Saturday, the monthly Sabbath day, which such as the new moon, the seasonal Sabbath day, such as uh, Passover, um, uh, Feast of Pentecost, uh, Feast of Tabernacle, uh, Feast of Dedication, um, and the other high holy days that are documented in the scriptures for us uh, where we come together and fellowship one with another um, and give glory and honor to Christ our King and God our Father. Okay? So now, 
killing the soul. Because if, if you can't walk in these statutes, then you're bringing death to your soul. Okay? And there's another way that you can bring death to your soul. The, the soul itself can be grieved to death. So let's examine that. Let's go to Wisdom of Solomon. Chapter 1, verse 11. Therefore, be aware of murmuring, which is unprofitable, and refrain your tongue from backbiting. For there is no word so secret that shall go for naught, nothing. And the mouth that belieth slayeth the soul. This word right here, belieth, it means to lie, to slander, uh, not being truthful, honest. And the mouth that belieth slayeth the soul, the Bible says. So you as an individual, on one hand, you got to be mindful of these kind of individuals that you come into, that you that you come around. If you're coming around such individuals, get away. Because they will destroy your soul they will defeat your confidence your uh your your courage and if this is you if, if you are the individual with the mouth a murmuring spirit uh a net uh, uh, uh what you call it um Nagging, nagging, uh, a nagging Betty. Okay, if that's you, you too, you need to repent because you're just, you are destroying another soul. When you come into, when you come around that individual and you, you're nagging, you are uh, murmuring, you are slanderous towards that individual. You're destroying that soul. Okay. <clears throat> Go to Matthew chapter 26. <clears throat> verse 37 to 38. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee. And began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. So Christ is dealing with the heaviness. He's dealing with the heaviness of, of what he has to face. He knows and understands that he has to allow himself to be captured, to be taken in um, by the Romans, uh, gone through a bogus trial, go through a bogus trial, be condemned to death by way of crucifixion, be crucified. He understands that he has to go through that. And the, the, the thought of that weighs heavy <laughs> on his soul. Okay. Go to um, Sirach chapter 38 verse 16 through 18.
My son, let tears fall down over the dead and begin to lament as if thou hast suffered great harm thyself and then cover his body according to the custom and neglect not his burial. Weep bitterly and make great moan and use lamentation as he is worthy. And that a day or two less thou be evil spoken of and then comfort thyself for thy heaviness, right? So even when we are dealing with the loss of a loved one, a close friend, a companion, he says, hey, do grieve over that death and, and don't be so tough and hard that um, others around you are, are not able to witness you grieving over the loss of a loved one. He says, do it such that, you know, if you don't, you know, because you're being so tough and macho, he says, they will speak evil of you because you're being so tough and macho. You can't shed a tear for a loved one. But after you have shed a tear and after you have allowed a day or two to pass and grieving over this loved one, he says, comfort yourself. Don't get so bogged down in the thought of the loss of this loved one. Verse 18, for of heaviness cometh death and the heaviness of the heart breaketh strength. Okay, which we spoke in Wisdom of Solomon. The heaviness breaketh the strength. You have an individual who is complaining, murmuring, slandering. You're going to break the strength of that individual. You're going to bring heaviness to the soul of that individual. To the individual, he himself or she. You're always depressed, down and out. You can't find uh, no reason for living. You're going to bring death to yourself. So the soul can only bear so much grief. The soul can only bear so much grief and anguish. Okay. Let's go to Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So we talked about how grieving can bring death to the soul. But then ultimately, there is the Father in heaven who has the power to destroy your soul. So Christ is saying, hey, don't fear that individual who might shoot you in the head, taking your life. To the onlooker, you are no more. But to those who understand spiritual things, to those who understand the mysteries of, of heaven and of God, 
we understand that no, we continue to live. We continue to live. Go to Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 22. Fear ye not me, saith the Lord. Will ye not tremble at my presence, which have placed the sand for the bound of the sea by a perpetual decree that it cannot pass it? And though the waves thereof toss themselves, yet can they not prevail? Though they roar, yet can they not pass over it? we see the magnificence of our Heavenly Father who's created all things, right? We know Jesus Christ created all things. And our Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ are two different entities. So uh, it's not that I'm trying to say that they're one, uh, that they it's the same entity. I'm not saying that. But anyway, you won't fear the most high God? He's saying, how dare you? Christ told you. That's who you better fear, but rather fear him, which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. For all eternity. You don't want this. Okay. Go to Revelation. Chapter 20. Verse 11 and 12. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God and the books were opened and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. You lived a life contrary to the Bible. Your judgment is not looking good. You lived and walked in good standing, in good keeping, according to the commandments the ordinances, the statutes. Things are looking great for you. Let's go to Daniel chapter 12, verse two. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Matthew, 10 and 28, Jesus Christ said, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Okay. Let's go to Matthew chapter 13. Verse 
verse 10 through 16. And his disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? And he answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. For whosoever hath to him shall be given. And he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away even that he hath. Therefore, speak I to them in parables, because they see, see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which said, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand. And seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear. Right? Back up here. Verse 12. For whosoever hath, you got understanding? To him shall be given more understanding. And he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, you don't have any understanding? You don't have any faith? From him shall be taken away even that he hath. The little understanding that you might have had, it's taken away. The faith that you might have had is taken away. The grievance on your soul is going to further compound the heaviness is going to further compound and destroy you. Go to Mark chapter 4 verse 10 and 12. Mark chapter 4 verse 10 and 12. 10 through 12. And when he was alone, they that were about him with the twelve asked of him the parable. And he said unto them, Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables, that seeing they may see and not perceive. He says, I'm going to put it in a face, but I'm going to speak it in a parable. They'll see it. It's made available, but they won't understand. They'll see it. They'll keep on going. And hearing, they may hear and not understand. They'll hear me speak these words and they'll hear my disciples who come after me on the street corners in 2024 preaching from the pages translated in English in Spanish in Creole in French etc and they won't understand It won't register. They'll think it's foolish. Lest at any time they should be converted and their sins should be 
forgiven them. See, two thirds of the children of Israel, it is destined for them, for this that we read in verse 12 to happen. They'll see and not perceive. They'll hear and not understand. They'll get angry, they'll fuss, they'll cuss, they'll call you out and, and say all kind of disparaging words to you. Why? Because it is set for them to stumble and fall because of their lack of belief when they had an opportunity. What you mean when they had an opportunity? Okay, let's go to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter six. Hebrews chapter six, verse one. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this will we do if God permit for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. If you had an opportunity to repent and you dissed it, you abused it, Now, here's where we, we, we're going to go off the reservation a little bit. See, this right here, where you had this opportunity, maybe you were born in 1980. Maybe you were born in 1990. Maybe you were born in 1960 or 1945. You know, maybe you were born and you are still alive right now. 20 years, 60 years, 80 years in the making. You're still alive right now. Where were you before you were born? Michael, what are you talking about? Well, let me entertain for a moment. Let's go to Ecclesiastes chapter one. And we look, we'll start with, um, Verse four, one generation passeth away and another generation cometh, but the earth abideth forever. Okay, so generation, one generation passeth away and another generation cometh, right? Um, but the earth abideth forever. All right, the sun also ariseth and the sun goeth down and hasteth 
to his place where he arose. Hmm. So we got the sun. It goes, it comes, goes down. And when it comes back, it's, it's the same sun. Same sun. All right. Verse six. The wind goeth toward the south and turneth about unto the north. It whirleth about continually. And the wind returneth again according to his circuits. So now we also see the same pattern of the wind. When the wind comes and goes according to its circuit, it comes back. It's like the sun comes back. It's the same sun. It's the same wind. All the rivers of all the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full unto the place from whence the rivers come, thither they return again. Um, I'm in Missouri. So right where I live is the Mississippi River. The Mississippi River falls into the Gulf of Mexico. And yet the Gulf of Mexico never overfills. Why? We call it in science, the water cycle. Be it as it may, water cycle. In that cycle, that water is returning and returns and returns, according to verse 7. Verse 8, all things are full of labor. Man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing nor the ear filled with hearing. The thing, write that down, thing. The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be. And that which is done is that which shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. Let's find out what the thing is. What is the thing? Let's go, we're going to stay in the book, Ecclesiastes, and let's go to chapter 6, verse 10. That which hath been is named already, and it is known that it is man. And it is known that it is man. Okay? That's the part that we want. Neither may he contend with him. That's not the part that we're after in terms of context. Precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little and there a little. Right? That it is man. Let's go back to Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and 9. The thing, man, that hath been, it is that, he is that, she is that, which shall be. And that which is done is that which shall be done. You repented in your previous life and you continue to walk the walk. All praises. You're going to repent again. You rejected Christ in your previous life. You're going to reject him again. Because Hebrews says, for it is impossible, Hebrews chapter 6 and 4, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. It is impossible, the Bible says. All right? So, and there is no new thing under the sun. That child is not new. That child, that brand new infant, has been here before. That soul has been here before. 
the soul in that child has been here before. Verse 10. Is there anything whereof it may be said, see, this is new. It hath been already of old time, which was before us. There is no remembrance of former things. But that soul, that soul, when it comes back, it will have no remembrance of the previous time it was here or previous times it was here. Neither shall there be any remembrance of things that are to come with those that shall come after. And neither will it remember its future. It won't know that, oh, I was righteous in my former life. I'm going to be righteous in my future life. I was a, 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 a bum in my former life, bum meaning I, I did not walk according to the commandments. And I'm going to be a bum in my future life. Okay. Um, now, let me show you something. Let me show you, there, there's a case study in the Bible to validate this idea of regeneration. Because what we just read in Ecclesiastes, the concept is called regeneration. Watch this. Look at this, this uh, case study, if you will. This is the Gospel of John, chapter 9 and verse 1. And Jesus passed by. He saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Right? Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Notice again, like we read earlier, Christ does not rebuke his disciples. You dumb nincompoops, what the heck do you mean that this man sinned or did his parents sin? No, he doesn't uh, rebuke them. He doesn't uh, berate them, condemn them. He says, nope, neither this man sinned nor did uh, his parents sin, right? This man was born blind. And the question was, did he sin? Was that the cause that he was born blind? So if they can ask that question and Christ doesn't, correct them, here is evidence that this man had lived before. The man had lived before. Okay? Let's also go to Gospel of John chapter 1 verse 19 through 21. And this is the record of John, when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who art thou? And he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Art thou Elias? And he said, I am not. Art thou that prophet? And he answered, no. Why is John the Baptist saying that, no, I'm not Elias. 
You know, are you that prophet? No, I'm, I'm, I'm not. I'm not Christ. I'm not Elias. But here's the thing. And let's go here. Go to Matthew chapter 17, verse 9 through 13. Okay. And as they came down from the mount, the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elias must first come? Right? So the scribes are calling John the Baptist. Um well, I'm sorry. I apologize. I got ahead of the storyline. Forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. Um, the scribes are saying that Elias must first come. I, 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 uh, just bear with me because I let the cat out the bag. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elias truly shall first come and restore all things. But I say unto you that Elias is come already and they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. Then the disciples understood that he spake unto them of John the Baptist. So the disciples then understood that Elias and John the Baptist or one in the same soul. Elias and John the Baptist are one in the same soul. Return into the earth. But why is it that in John chapter 1, that John the Baptist does not understand himself to be the soul of um, Elijah return into the earth. Ecclesiastes chapter one, verse 11. There is no remembrance of former things. Neither shall there be any remembrance of those things, of things that are to come with those that shall come after. Okay. Okay. And so there we have that. Um, now, go to, let's go back to Mark. Let's go back to Mark chapter four. And we'll start at verse 12. That seeing, they may see and not perceive. And hearing, they may hear and not understand. Lest at any time they should be converted and their sins should be forgiven them. It is appointed to some not to repent. It is appointed to some to repent. To the psalm, it is appointed. Why? Because they rejected. They rejected the salvation of Christ. When? I don't know. For that soul. For that soul, when? I don't know. Okay, let's go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We're going to read verse 3. We're going to read 3 through 12. Let no man deceive you by any means, 
for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. Perdition, hell. Okay? It says, not until that man of sin be revealed. Who is the man of sin? The bogus Christ. Here we are, Google. Let's type in Jesus Christ. Let's go to images. This right here is the man of sin. This is blasphemy. This is a lie from the pits of hell. And just look at who it represents. Look at who this represents. And I don't mean Jesus Christ. I mean the people. The race that this stands in the gap for. Okay? So then, back to 2 Thessalonians. Uh, and that that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Why? Because when we look at the scripture, the description of Jesus Christ is that of a dark-complected man with woolly textured hair. And then when we look in the scripture, father like son, you look at the father in the book of Daniel, he too has woolly textured hair. Both God the father and Christ are dark-complected people representing who? A race of people. Verse 5. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now ye know that ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who know let it will let until he be taken out of the way. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. What do you mean? Go to Matthew. Actually, let's go to Titus. Titus chapter, uh-oh. Bear with me. Something happened. Computer's doing something. I don't know what it's doing. All right, there we go. Titus chapter 3, verse 5. Okay, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Now, to my Christian viewers, to my Christian viewers, I love you dearly. Uh, let's very quickly sidetrack so that we can show, provide a biblical definition of this word Holy Ghost. And then, and then come back to what we're trying to get at here in Thessalonians. 
mystery of iniquity. So for this, let's go to Acts chapter 7. Okay, uh, Acts chapter 7, and here we are. We want to examine verse 51, 52, and 53. We want to examine 51, 52, and 53. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. There's the word. As your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers, right? The, uh, you've been betrayers and murderers of the just one, of Jesus Christ, okay? Okay. Who received the who, making reference to uh, the fathers, right? Your fathers, your fathers did so, so do ye. Your fathers have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. They received the law did not keep it. You do always resist, resist the Holy Ghost. Did not keep, uh, I'm sorry, receive the law, have not kept it. You do always resist the Holy Ghost. The law and the Holy Ghost is one and the same. Interchangeable words. The law and the Holy Ghost are interchangeable words communicating the same concept, the same idea, the same thought, the same thing. Okay. Let's go back to Titus. Why? Because we're trying to see the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Titus not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration, which we just read about in Ecclesiastes. See, in Ecclesiastes chapter one, verse four through verse 11, we read about this idea of regeneration. We read about this idea of regeneration. And in Titus, we're being told how we are cleansed and purged through regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost, renewing of the law. Let's go to Matthew chapter 19, verse 28. Matthew chapter 19, verse 28. And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. This is the process. This is the mystery. But it's also the mystery of iniquity. Because in this process, Go back to Ecclesiastes, verse chapter 1, verse 9. The thing that hath been 
it is that which shall be. And that which is done is that which shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. Right? So we come back. And either we come back repented or we come back unrepented. Okay? And this may be a hard pill for some to swallow. I understand. Okay. Um, let us continue on. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 29, verse 9 through 14. Stay yourselves and wonder. Cry ye out and cry. They are drunken, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with strong drink. For the Lord hath poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep and hath closed your eyes. The prophets and your rulers, the seers, hath he covered. And the vision of all is become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed, which men deliver to one that is learned, saying, read this, I pray thee. And he said, I cannot, for it is sealed. And the book is delivered to him that is not learned, saying, read this, I pray thee. And he said, I am not learned. Wherefore, the Lord said, for as much as this people draw near me with their mouth and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. You're listening to Creflo Dollar. You're listening to T.D. Jakes. You're listening to uh, Juanita Bynum. You're listening to Joyce Meyer. You're listening to John Hagee. You're listening to uh, Steve Perry. You're listening to all these people instead of listening to thus saith the Lord, thus the scriptures, precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little and there a little. You're not listening to it. And neither are you applying it to your life. Neither are you applying it to your life. Which is why he says, for as much as this people draw near me with their mouth and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. You go to church on Sunday, not Saturday. You say, well, just pray over it and you eat whatever you want to eat. When you can't find the scripture in the old or the new, that says we now worship on Sunday. You can't show that in, in proper context. I challenge you. I challenge you. You can't show the scripture in the old or the new that says you can eat what you want to eat. I challenge you. I challenge you. You can't show in the scripture where we can go about our daily life and willfully sin 
and not put our best foot forward from transgressing God's law. We are expected, it is expected of us to put our best foot forward. And therefore, it is possible for us to walk and not transgress God's law. Let me detour one quick second. This was not in my notes, but let me detour one quick second. We're going to go to 1 John. First John, there we go. Chapter five, verse three. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not grievous. They're not hard. It's not a burden to keep God's laws, to keep the Sabbath day holy, to change your diet to, um, to that which is documented in Leviticus chapter 11. It's not hard. It's not um, hard to, oh, I just had the thought in my mind and it, and it, it just left me that quick. But whatever the case is, it's not hard, right? To not shave your beard off, to not bald your head, It's not hard or grievous for a woman to no longer wear pants and to put on a dress seven days a week. And for both the man and the woman to put fringes in their gar garments, it's not hard. Otherwise, if you say it's hard, if you say it's hard, then you're saying that, A, you're saying that, that my interpretation of this passage is wrong. Show me so that I'm not walking in ignorance. Or, you're lying against this scripture. You're either saying that my understanding of this passage is wrong, to which end I say, okay, show me, give me the understanding I should have, or you are lying against what this says, this passage. Okay. Let's go back to Isaiah. Let's now go to, uh, oh, did we read all of this? No, we didn't. Let's read verse 13 again. This is Isaiah chapter 29. We're going to read verse 13 and 14. Wherefore the Lord said, for as much as this people draw near me with their mouth and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. Therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, even a marvelous work and a wonder for the wisdom of their wise men shall perish and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. Right? So wherein you're going to go and say, 
Hey, learn it, man. Show me what this means. I'm unable to, to give you the understanding. I, whoever I am, whoever that learned man is. You're going to go to the unlearned person and say, hey, show me what this means. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to be able to give you that understanding, whoever the unlearned man or woman is. Right? Such that you yourself, your soul is going to continually be in utter darkness. Your hearing shall for shall forever be dull. Okay, let's go to Isaiah chapter 66, verse 4. Isaiah chapter 66, verse 4. I also will choose their delusions and will bring their fears upon them. Because when I called, none did answer. When I spake, they did not hear, but they did evil before mine eyes and chose that in which I delighted not. He says, I am going to choose your delusion. You are thinking that you are okay with the most high God and you're not. This is the iniquity, the mystery of iniquity already at work. So let's go back to 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who know let it will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Speaking of the children of Satan, the particular race of Satan, not to mention the two thirds of the children of Israel that follow the heathen, that follow the Gentile that follow upon the, the mountains. I think that was what we read earlier in Ezekiel, right? Uh, I believe that was Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 15 that hath not eaten upon the mountains. So two thirds are going to eat upon the mountains. Back to Thessalonians, second Thessalonians. Uh, verse 10, second Thessalonians chapter two, verse 10. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. You had pleasure doing church on Sunday because that, that was easy. You get up, you leave the house, nine o'clock, 10 o'clock, whatever. Church is done at two o'clock. Off you go. When you leave at two o'clock, you go and you, you're headed to church's chicken, which if you're keeping the Sabbath day, there's no buying or selling on the Sabbath day. Your food 
for the Sabbath day was prepared the day before. You're running late to church. You got to stop at Walgreens because you need some stockings, you know, because you got to run in your stocking or your pantyhose. I, I have witnessed all these different things. Michael, pull over. I got to stop at Walgreens. You know, back this, this was back way back in the day. I experienced these things. Okay. Um, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Okay. Let's go to Luke chapter 20, verse 38. For he is not a God of the dead, but of the living, for all live unto him. Right? We die, we come back. When we come back, we go through the regeneration process. Some regenerate to life eternal. Some, you're on a path to eternal damnation. Let's go to Exodus chapter 20, verse 5. Okay. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord, thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. So we come back in the third and fourth generation. We come back. And we still belong to that family that we belong to, right? Why do you say that? Here's Numbers chapter one, verse 18. And they assembled all the congregation together on the first day of the second month. And they declared their pedigrees. This means your, your lineage. Your lineage, your biology. After their families, by the house of their fathers. Your father was an Edomite. You an Edomite. Your father was a Judite. You a Judite. Your father was the tribe of Issachar. You're the tribe of Issachar. Remember the law to the half tribe of, of, of Manasseh was that those, if, if, a man had a daughter and did not have a son. And if the daughter was going to retain the inheritance of the father, she had to choose a husband of the tribe for which she belonged. So those daughters half-tribe of Manasseh, they had to choose a husband who were likewise of the tribe of Manasseh. Because if they had chosen a husband, say, of Simeon, 
then their father, their father's inheritance is going to be damaged. It was going to be damaged. It's going to be marred. The Bible uses the word marred. Okay? So, we come back in the fourth, I'm sorry, in the third and fourth generation. Verse six. And showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Here's the flip side of that coin. In the third and fourth generation, I am going to execute judgment. Whether or not you come back in the regeneration uh, judging the 12 tribes of Israel, or whether or not you come back lost to, to utter damnation. Okay? Let's go to John. Chapter 11, verse 25 through 26. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believeth thou this? Don't believe, Michael. Do you believe the words of Christ? And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believeth thou this? Do you believe this? Right? Let's go to Revelation. We want Revelation chapter 2, verse 11. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. None of us have experienced the second death as of yet. Remember, we've already read that he is not the God of the, of the dead, but of the living. Right? So regeneration teaches us that we come back. If we come back, that means we have experienced the first death. How many times have we experienced the first, the first death? I don't know. I don't know. But no one as of yet has experienced the second death. Go to Revelation chapter 20, verse 6. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Right? You repented? You repented however many go-rounds back? Oh, praises. Second death hath no power on you. Continue to stay in the fight. Don't give up. Don't give in. Go to Revelation. We want chapter 20. We want verse 13 through 14. 
And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. This hasn't happened yet. This is set to happen, but it hasn't happened as of yet. There is no end of all the souls. Okay. Go to Revelation chapter 21. Verse 8. There we go. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. These are traits, behaviors, that you actively participate in, you might want to check yourself. You might want to, here in the United States, turn towards Jerusalem, face Jerusalem, and with uplifted hands, beg for forgiveness. Repent and walk in the way of righteousness. Let's go to Luke. Chapter 13, we want verse 26 through 28. Then shall ye begin to say, we have eaten and drunk in, the, in thy presence, and thou hast taught in our streets. But he shall say, I tell you, I know you not whence ye are. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when ye shall see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, and you yourselves thrust out. See, these folks, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they're back in the earth. Now they are back in the earth. If not in this second in time, they will be back in the earth. Elijah is back in the earth. Isaiah is back in the earth. Rebecca is back in the earth. I don't know who they are. I don't know what their, their name is. I don't even know what they look like. But through the regeneration, we're confident they're back in the earth. No one has tasted the second death as of yet. Okay? And so here you are, the opportunity, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the prophets, they're here saying, the kingdom is at hand. The kingdom is at hand. Repent ye, repent ye, for the kingdom is at hand. And you disregard them. He don't know what he's talking about. He don't know what he's talking about. He taking that text fully out of context. He don't know what he's talking about. And then Christ returns. He cracks open the sky for the second 
and final death. And now you're begging and pleading and it's too late. Let's go to Revelation chapter 20, verse 15. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And we don't want this for no man, woman, or child. <clears throat> we, we would be speaking against biblical prophecy. If we were to say, oh, this is not going to happen. No. Zechariah showed us two thirds. This is going to happen. For those that I have crossed paths with, I know and close to me, I pray, I pray that every last one of you repent. I don't want this to be your fate, your outcome. Go to John chapter 5, verse 28 through 29. Marvel not at this. For the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. This is what the text says. I'm not making it up. Maybe you disagree with my presentation on tonight. And show me. Enlighten me. Because if I'm off, surely you don't want me to be in ignorance. So enlighten me. Precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. Every word in this Bible, study it. Every law, every commandment, apply it to your life. Please the Lord. Don't please man, please the Lord. Let's go to Psalms 23 verse three. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Right. Israel is going to live forever. One third of Israel is going to do what they must do in keeping the commandments in following the faith of Jesus Christ. Last, let's go to Psalms chapter six, verse five. For in death, there is no remembrance of thee. In the grave, 
who shall give thee thanks? We die, come back, you come back, there's no remembrance to the natural living. You are a newborn babe, born at 12 o'clock, live a life, 70, 80 years, 90, if you're blessed, and then you die again and the cycle continues until the second death. I want to show one more thing. I own a peace lily. And this plant it's a, it's a it's a beautiful plant in my opinion. Okay, and this part, this is the male attribute of of the plant. This is the female attribute of the plant. Okay. And these will bud ever um, so often. Uh, these are not always present. And when they bud, um, it will drop pollen onto the leaf. And the leaf, new growth will come in this plant as long as you put water in it, this plant right here, I've had my plant now for 12, 13 years. I've, um, I've transplanted it once, once, twice. Transplanted it out of, out of the pot into another pot twice. From the original pot when I when I purchased it uh, into another pot and then into the uh, current pot and it's been in the current pot for eight years, I think. And the leaves they die, they die. New leaf grows. Old leaves die. New leaves grow. Old leaves die new leaves grow and yet this is the same plant there is no the plant is indoors there are no bees or insects that come and pollinate it it's regenerating this goes through the process of regeneration it is what it is. This leaf will die and another one, the same one, will come in its place. Over and over and over again. One generation passeth and another generation cometh. But the earth abideth forever. Okay? When the leaf dies, no one thinks about it. While this plant is alive, it's doing its magic. And so if you take this analogy and apply it to us, this is us regenerating in this life. And I pray, brothers and sisters, that for you, you are regenerating to, where was that passage at? That you are regenerating unto the resurrection of life.
That is my prayer. All right. With that, um, subscribe to the channel. Share the video. Um, push the like button. We love you. Um, reach out to us so that you can, uh, so, so we can discuss how you can be a part of Children of Israel Ministries located here in uh, Florissant, Missouri. All right, we come together every Saturday for Sabbath class. Shalom, Mosiah Christ bless.